Good afternoon, everybody. This is Peter Cooper from the NCBI. Um, today, we're going to have a webinar uh, that's going to show you some teaching examples that use our BLAST service. This is another, this is the second in the series of these teaching example handouts that we make that we've distributed um, at conferences and off of our FTP site. And this, this was presented in part uh, at a uh, cell biology conference a few years ago. By the way, my name is Peter Cooper. As I said, if you need to get in touch with me, that's my email address, peter.cooper at nih.gov. So as I mentioned, we have these uh, case study teaching examples. There are uh, three of them on the FTP site. We talked about the one using Entree Direct last time um, that I gave a webinar. This one's gonna be about using BLAST. And the idea behind these is you can use them if you teach undergraduate courses that involve uh, bioinformatics or using BLAST, you can use these uh, as sort of starting points for making your own examples. So here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna talk a little bit about BLAST, just to make a few tips about BLAST that I think everybody should know, to do a little evangelism about some things that we at the help desk would like people to know. Talk about some related alignment services, and then we'll go through the examples. We're gonna use five different ones. One of them has two sort of two parts. One of them is gonna be identifying uh, bacteria using 16S ribosomal RNA sequences. We're gonna design primers for a gene product and a gene. We're gonna make some trees using some of the add-ons to BLAST. We're gonna do one that shows the phylogeny of the apes using mitochondrial genomes. One that shows the, an evolution, protein evolution where there are a number of paralogs of creatine kinases and we can make a, a protein tree. We're gonna annotate an unannotated bacterial uh, contig and then we're gonna map a protein, in fact, the same one that we got from that bacterial contig onto a conserved domain and a 3D structure for that protein. So a couple of things, what's BLAST anyway? Um, this is probably the most widely used sequence similarity search tool in the world. It finds high scoring local alignments between two sequences. It includes a model of score distributions for random local alignments, which means that it can provide statistical significance for alignments and the main um, statistic there is the expect value, which is the number of hits, the same or better score that you would expect by chance. In practice, that doesn't actually come up that much in people's everyday searches. We'll talk about why that is in a moment. Just to remind you what BLAST tells you about, it tells you about these non-chance similarities between biological sequences. If they're not due to chance, then they're due to something else, these high scoring similarities. Homology is the classic thing that BLAST is about. These things are related because they're evolved from a common ancestor. But in practice these days, a lot of times BLAST is used simply to identify something. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And in order to use BLAST, of course, you have to have a nucleotide or protein sequence. So these are sort of the three related things that BLAST does. It can answer the following kinds of questions. What's my sequence related to and what does it do? This is about homology or the presence of conserved domains. Is it already in the database? That's identification. So you're gonna find the matching sequence, or as we'll see today, you could find the potential organism that that sequence probably belonged to. And then the last thing is about sort of assembly or annotation issues. Where is it located? How is it organized? What kinds of things are on my sequence? Here's all the evangelism part that I wanted to mention. Um, and this has to do with the size of the BLAST databases and some rules that you should think about. Um, the BLAST databases are quite large. Many of the, the default ones in particular are enormous. And in general, the bigger the search space, the longer the search takes. And I will add, the more likely it is to fail, which happens a bit. And the expect value for a particular hit increases linearly with the size of the database. Now that's kind of a cryptic statement until you take it apart and think about what it means. What it means is this, you are much more likely to be able to get and interpret your results if you search the smallest database that is likely to contain this target of interest. And that's one of the things I want, points I wanna to make today. Most searches are against the default databases. Consider searching other databases. And we're gonna look at some of those today, RefSeq Protein, um, the Model Organisms database, the 16S ribosomal RNA database. And always, I can't think of an example where you wouldn't wanna do this, Use an organism or an entree query to limit the size of the database uh, further. And you can adjust the expect value cutoff to limit to only significant matches. We'll see some examples of that today. Just a couple more words about the programs. 
The nucleotide search programs, uh, by default, we use a thing called Megablast, a discontiguous Megablast. There will be times when you may need to make the search more sensitive. In fact, I'll use contiguous Megablast to make a search more sensitive today. So you can change the particular nucleotide search program. For protein searches, you can do a straight BLAST P, which is protein against protein. You can also translate, and we're going to do a BLAST X search today to look at an unannotated nucleotide sequence. We're also going to run a conserved domain search, which tells us about functional elements or you know, similar uh, kinds of structures and things like that. And this has a greater look back time, and it tells you more about the structure function of the protein than an ordinary BLAST search does. That runs every time you run a BLAST search. I'm also going to use some other alignment services today. These are not BLAST. They're related things. Primer BLAST, which will help you design primers that are specific and don't amplify other things in the database. Mole BLAST is just um, kind of a demonstration program, but it will use it with, with our 16S. It's a good thing for clustering these things and finding out what the sources are. And Cobalt, which is our protein multiple alignment tool. Okay, how do you get the BLAST? The BLAST homepage has access to all the different programs. And in fact, any of the main programs, you can change what kind of search you're doing right on the page. Um, the other tools that we're gonna that are listed at the bottom here, the ones we're gonna use today are Mole Blast, Primer Blast, and we're gonna use a multiple alignment search. So here are the things we're gonna do. Identify uncultured bacterial 16S sequences. Design primers to amplify the coding region of a gene, human myeloperoxidase, the transcript. And if we, and I'll show you at least start you on getting exon 10. We're going to make phylogenetic trees based on ape mitochondrial genome sequences. And in, I'm using ape in the broad sense here that it includes human. Uh, and also tetrapod vertebrate cretin kinase genes. Tetrapods are creatures with four legs um, like us although we call it two of them arms. Then we're gonna annotate coding regions on a prokaryotic genomic sequence from metagenome. We're gonna find conserved domains in that particular uncharacterized protein. So what I'll do for each search is I'll just set it up and we'll go ahead and show you what happens when we do it. So we're gonna, the first one's gonna be identifying these 20 uncultured bacterial 16S sequences that are in the database. Um, they don't tell you much about them, just that they're ribosomal RNAs. So we can use 16S rRNA type strains database, which is on the BLAST page, get a distance tree of results, manipulate those things, and we can look at mole BLAST to do this. So let's set that one up. I'm gonna to go to the website. And what I've got up here is just a little cheat sheet for me because, and this is one of the documents that's in there. So we can use these 20 uncultured bacterial sequences that are listed here. And I made myself a little link that basically just is a URL to retrieve these. And there they are. And so, you know, you don't actually need to visit the BLAST homepage to run BLAST uh, from the nucleotide pages. We can simply click this run BLAST link here. My 20 are in there. And then this is where we're going to do some things to um, help us, we're gonna change the database. So the sequences that I'm talking about are in the default database, but there's a lot of other stuff in there. So the one we want is this 16S ribosomal RNA sequence database, and that contains type strain sequences that NCBI has curated and identified. Now, not everything is in there, but a lot of things are in there. And so we can set that up and run the search. Um, and to save time, I'm not gonna spend our time running searches I've actually got the RIDs available so we can just retrieve them. And these should last for several months. Um, there's also a link that will help you set it. If you want to just set up the page the way I have it set up, you can just use this compressed URL link here and that will set it up. But what I'm going to do is go ahead and retrieve the results so we can take a look at them. So this is, we did 20 sequences and we have 20 different results pages here. If we wanted to get them all on one page, we could do that by downloading them. And so we can see if we managed to identify them, what we can do to do that, let me blow this up a little bit. You can scroll through these and you can see that you have the, the coverage of 99% over a lot of these where you have a type strain named here, Shigella dysentery. Um, and so we can be fairly confident that this is probably 
uh, a good species or genus level identification of this sequence. You can just sort of run through them one at a time if you want to, to see that most of these have been at least identified fairly closely. For any one of these, we could take a look at a distance tree of the results here, which I'll go ahead and do for this one. We'll come back to this in a little bit. And you can see where it fits in here. You can expand this to see what organisms are in there. We can zoom in to find that query sequence if we want to. And so it's, it clusters right there with Shigella. So we can pretty, be pretty confident that that's probably a Shigella sequence. A lot of these will cluster together. Escherichia and Shigella actually belong really to the same genus. Uh, as an extension of this, we can use Moleblast to look at this a little bit to show you a way of clustering all these things together. And I'll just show you that quickly. I'll go back over here to my Moleblast is, of course, linked to the um, last homepage. But I can simply grab the URL here to go there directly. I think I need to mobile blast CGI on there, but there it is on the bottom of the page here. And I can take those sequences that we had a moment ago and put them all in there. And I'll change my database here to the one that I talked about before, the 16S ribosome RNA sequences, and I can just run that. This has a, this does a blast search, but it also does a full multiple sequence alignment on these sequences, uh, and then it will give me a tree that clusters them. And what's good about this is it clusters them not only with the 16S sequences, but also with each other. And so I selected several that are probably from the same species, and so we'll see that result show up here when we do that. So while that's cooking, I'm just going to go back to my slides, and we'll come back to that result in just a moment. So the next thing I want to show you is how to use primer blast, and we're going to design primers for myeloperoxidase. We're going to do a couple of interesting things here. We're going to use the features table to get a subregion, and we'll design primers. We can check those primers, uh, and we're going to use some of the special databases that are RefSeq databases on the primer blast page. Um, to make our results more specific. So let's let Moleblast continue to run. Go back over here and we'll start on this particular one. So what I'm going to do is to retrieve the um, sequence that we're going to work with, which is a myeloperoxidase sequence. So this is a... a human messenger RNA, and what we might want to do is amplify a particular portion of this um, from some kind of a cDNA experiment, some kind of a library. And so I notice that I can go down here to the feature table, and I can select this uh, CDS, the coding region. Uh, that's going to be from the start code onto the stop code onto the sequence. If I click on that, it gives me, it's, it highlights it for me. There's the ATG start right there. I can display this. It doesn't matter what format. I'm just going to pick FASTA. And so then what I can do is go over here and pick primers. And that's going to basically just give me this sequence as a template in Primer Blast. Now to use Primer Blast, what I have to do is I can, there's all kinds of settings that have to do with the primers, specificity, and things like that. And I'll go ahead and leave those alone. The main thing Primer Blast does is blast is it checks your primers at the end to see if they're going to amplify additional things in the database. And so you have to set a database down here. And this is the organism limit, which we'll use more um, in a few minutes. That That's the tax ID for human. It's exactly the same as doing this. So we could run that if we want. And Primer Blast takes a moment to run. So I'll go ahead and um, cut to the chase and show you my results that are over here. 
One of the things that I did have to do that I didn't point out, and it's pointed out to you in the instructions, this uh, the size of this amplified sequence here is fairly large. It's over um, 2,400 bases long, and that's a bit large for PCR. People usually want shorter ones than that, but you can do it. So I had to adjust that parameter on Primer Blast in order to get this result. So then I have a set of primers here. There are 10 primer pairs by default. They all should be uh, equally good. And they would amplify this entire coding region here, which is actually highlighted for you up here in this um, viewer of the messenger RNA sequence. So we're back to uh, looking at mole blast. This just shows you that we have um, the results are finished here. I just wanted to point out to you that we can see those now. Go ahead and expand this. One of the things about the tree viewer is if you have a big screen, it works a little bit better than it does on a little screen like a laptop, which is where I am right now. But you can see our bacterial clones and how they cluster within the different uh, groups of bacteria here, and they cluster with each other. So these are probably from very closely related organisms. Um, and this is probably not one of the ones that does, a, we probably don't have this particular organism perhaps represent, represented in our database, it depends. These ones that have sort of longer branch links here. Okay, that's an aside. Let's go back to what we were doing before, which is working on primer blast. I'm going to go ahead and close Mole Blast here. Now, one of the things that we might want to do is to see if our primers that we just designed would amplify these particular sequences from other organisms. So I can basically take these primers and put them back into Primer Blast. And this is using Primer Blast in a different way. I'll go ahead and just show you that setup. So I'm going to take the two primers that we just designed. Ah, there we go. So I put the two primers that we just designed in here. And what I've done is I've changed the, the organism restriction here so that we're now looking at primates. And we could see if we could amplify these, this particular transcript from other primate transcriptomes that we have in the database. And that result is over here. That result is over here. And this is, um, so here is the one of the gibbons. We definitely would amplify that. Here's the human one, we already know about that. There's a gorilla, chimpanzee, bonobo, uh, one of the orangutans. I'm not sure what Cebus is. I think it's an old world monkey, an old world monkey, an old world monkey here, and so on and so forth. Now you can see that some of these have mismatches and if you adjust your stringency properly, you might not amplify them. But for the um, higher primates, you've only got like one mismatch, so the chances are they would probably work. Okay, and so you can do exactly the same thing, and I won't go through this one, but I'll set it up for you. You could start on the RefSeq gene record for this, and you could easily get um, exon 10 from the feature table and go ahead and analyze that to find primers that would amplify that. So let's do uh, at least one of the phylogenetic trees. And um, I think the ape mitochondrial genome is a good one to do. And what we're going to do here is we're going to restrict um, a particular database, RefSeq Genomic, which contains all of our genomic reference sequences. We're going to limit it to great apes or to uh, apes in general. And, and we're going to um, use an organism and an entree filter to limit that database to just the sequences of interest. And we can, again, manipulate the tree viewer display to get a particular kind of tree out of this. So let's go to the website again. So what I want to do is to get a particular sequence as a query. And what I've done is I've chosen what a lot of taxonomists or phylogeny type people call an outgroup sequence. And this is from a, um, a primate that's more distantly related to the apes. Uh, like humans and things like that. This is the uh, ringtail lemur, which a lot of people are familiar with. To set this up, I would simply choose run blast here, change my database 
do RefSeq Genomic. Enter my organism name here, which is Hominoidea, which is a superfamily that contains the great it that contains humans and the other apes. And I'm also going to put an entree query limit in here that would limit to the, the mitochondrial sequences, because sometimes there are mitochondrial sequences within the uh, nuclear genome. And this is the mitochondrial genome of the lemur up here. I can also, to make it a little more sensitive, I'll pick one of the more sensitive algorithms here, discontiguous megablast. You can also adjust algorithm parameters down here, such as the E value. So I want to make it so that things are fairly stringent. So I could put one in here, like one e to the minus 64. That means there really would be no chance that um, these are random alignments. These are going to be things that are distinctly uh, significant. And I'm going to go ahead and retrieve that result for you. So now I have hits to several of the great apes here. Um, you might recognize the names of these. are going to be chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, saimang is one of them, and the gibbons. And I can use the distance tree of results to get the tree. This is an interesting display here, but a little bit more useful is to do something like change the way this is laid out. And let's make it a circular tree. So here are the humans. And notice that there are extinct humans. People call this, this is the tribe homini or homonyms. The closest relate, relatives to us are the chimpanzee and the bonobo, which are over here. And here are the other great apes in the same family we are. The family hominidae is here. These are the gibbons and the saimang over here. And then here is our outgroup, which is the lemur mitochondrial genome. And I'll leave you with this one as it's sort of an example that you can run yourself. This is the homology search using um, creatine kinases. Um, it's the same principle as the one we just did, except this time we're going to be making a protein tree. And because there are numerous paralogs in here, you're going to have multiple homologs in the same species, which we call paralogs. Um, the extension of this is that you can run cobalt directly from the BLAST results to generate your phylogenetic tree. Uh, but it's pretty much exactly the same procedure, and you can use the links that are in the handout to get there if you want to. Let's skip ahead, and we'll go ahead and do this one, and then we'll probably need to wrap this up. This is uh, identifying a coding region on a genomic sequence. And um, we're going to use a particular sequence from a marine metagenome um, that's unannotated. We're going to search against a small database called the Landmark Database that will give us some particularly good matches from organisms where we know something about them. And it contains sort of all groups of organisms, archaea, bacteria, plants, animals. Um, and so we can do that to get a particular set of results. So let's go here to the website. So what we're going to do is start with a particular contig from this uh, eukaryotic, this, this prokaryotic marine metagenome. And so this has no annotation associated with it. We can run BLAST with it. And what we're going to do is change this up a little bit. We're going to go to a translating BLAST search. This is BLASTX. And so we're going to use the bacteria and archaea and we're going to use the landmark model organisms. We can either leave it like this with archaea and bacteria as the potential, because I know this is prokaryotic, or I can do the whole thing and leave it wide open. And I think the one that I showed you was doing leaving the whole thing wide open. I did change a couple of um, ex uh, parameters here. The E value threshold is set to a more significant value, 1 times 10 to the minus 6, which is something I suggest you always do. And I set the word size from the default of 6 to 3 to make this a more sensitive search. Let's go ahead and just take a quick look at those results. And so here's our query sequence. Each one of these matches is to a protein from one of the organisms 
proteomes that's in the database. So for example, here's a half nuclease, another helicase, these are all related proteins. There's a DNA topoisomerase one, and the other titles are all that DNA topoisomerase one. Here is a tRNA ligase for alanine. It's all annotated that way. It's from various organisms, and they all uh, the homology extends across into the plants there. So you can see evidence for one, two, three, four, five, maybe six uh, protein coding genes. The best hit is to one of this one of this archaeal sequence that's in the database, the Thanothermobacter thermoautotrophicus. And down here you have the coding region. Um, notice that we've matched a certain part of the query sequence, which is the nucleotide sequence. And the query sequence ends here. And notice it's on the opposite strand. But notice what we don't have is the coordinates of the actual opening reading frame. And an extension of this particular exercise is to use that with our OR finder tool, which is in the document, um, to get the complete open reading frame. And in fact, if you do that, you'll find that you get um, a complete open reading frame that you can use in the next example, which is a blast search against PDB, um, where you can find a structure model and a conserved domain. Um, and we run over time more than I intended to, so I think I've got to stop here and point you to the document itself, and you can take a look at the additional examples that are in there, and hopefully you'll find them useful in uh, any teaching that you have to do. So there are five and probably six if you count the two um, alignment-based trees as two different examples, uh, examples that you can adapt pretty easily to um, teaching, and I think they'd be useful for developing teaching exercises for undergraduate courses. On the last slide has a list, uh, a links to some um, URLs that are relevant to the material we talked about today and the material in the handout. Um, the teaching by example, the five different ones are available in our fact sheets directory. So um, let's take a few minutes for questions, Wayne, if we have anything. So one question was for the ape mitochondria search, why didn't lemurs show up in the results? That's a good question. The reason that lemurs didn't show up in the results is because I limited the database by using um, an organism query, and I limited it to the superfamily Hominoidea, which actually in our taxonomy database maps to the common word ape. That contains the great apes, which are the humans and the chimps and the gorillas, uh, and, um, and the orangutan, and the gibbons and the cymang. Um, so the lemur is a primate, but it's not part of that superfamily. So the query sequence does not show up in our results. If we had used primates, then we would have gotten the lemur sequence in our results. And one more general question. What's the difference between cobalt and other multiple sequence alignments like Fossil W? Okay, so the question is, what's the difference between cobalt and other multiple sequence alignment tools like Clustal W? Um, the difference is largely um, what... The sort of trick that a lot of multiple alignment tools use is they use an initial guide tree to cluster the sequences before they proceed with the multiple alignment because it reduces the amount of computation time that's required. So what COBOL does, it uses a constraint, and the constraint that it uses is the matches to the conserved domains that are in the proteins. So it uses, that's what the, the C in, well, it stands for constraint-based alignment tool, but the constraint that we use is to conserve domains in the proteins themselves to sort of begin to make a guide tree to generate that alignment. And it's probably more technical explanation than that in the COBOL paper, but that's the best one I can give you right now. They all have, you know, their merits and drawbacks, multiple alignment tools. Okay, if there are no other questions, so let's conclude uh, today's webinar. If you have any questions about this, um, you can write to me about those examples peter.cooper at nih.gov. If you have any questions about webinars in general, you can write to, write to our webinars address, webinars at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. Okay, thanks everybody for coming.